Join me on my travels as I explore extraordinary places and reveal bizarre tales and characters from our capital's rich history. In this program, the bizarre collection of the man who searched out superstitions, the invention that made its name at Buckingham Palace and took on filthy London, and the end of an era behind the walls of Wandsworth Prison. Dragon's blood love potions, lucky cow's hearts, charmed cat skins, even rolling pins of love. The sorts of things that would have gone out of fashion with burning witches and chastity belts. Or so you would have thought. But actually, it wasn't so very long ago that on these London streets, belief in such things was still very much alive. On the face of it, the late Victorian and Edwardian eras were a time when people were much more sensible and enlightened than previous generations. It was an age of science and industry and discovery. But one man spent his days scurrying up and down the streets of London discovering something else. That even at the turn of the 20th century, we really were a very superstitious lot indeed. That man was Edward Lovett, who worked in a smart and sensible city bank by day, but spent his evenings trawling through the docks and the East End, collecting everything he could about the capital's secretly superstitious underworld. Lovett found that it was people living in the slum areas of the capital who still believed in magic spells and lucky charms, and so he spent most of his time combing the streets here in East London. Lovett would simply go up to people in the street, in pubs or in markets, and talk to them on any pretext he could think of, like the weather, or the price of fish, or where they were from. But pretty soon he'd turn the conversation round to what they believed in, and he found some pretty extraordinary things. Lovett would listen to their stories of superstitions and write them down. He also acquired many of these strange, charmed possessions he'd heard about. And pretty soon, he began to amass a large collection of some of the most bizarre objects in London. And many of them can still be seen today. In the storage area of a Southwark Borough Museum, some of Lovett's strange collection has survived. Lovett collected hundreds of very bizarre items. Here are just a few of them tucked away. These are hag stones, stones with a hole through them usually found near a river or beach. The hole has been made by running water. If you came down to your stables first thing in the morning and your horse was hot and sweaty, it was thought it had been ridden during the night by pixies or witches or hags. So you'd get some hag stones and you'd hang them inside the stable. But you had to find them accidentally. You couldn't go and look for them, nor could you be given them. Had to be found accidentally for the charm to work. It was believed that magic couldn't work on running water, so hagstones, formed by running water, could protect from magic. This is a, a lucky horseshoe, but this one's clad in, wrapped in cloth, and the idea of this was that you put it up by your bed, and it would stop you having nightmares, making sure, of course, you put it the right way up, because if you put it like that, the light falls out. What else have we got here? Now, acorns. This is a little carved acorn. Now, acorns were thought to protect you from sudden and unexpected lightning strikes. So you'd have one of these around your person, or you could even have special acorns with tassels, which you'd attach to your umbrella, because the umbrella was thought to attract the lightning, so you'd have that there to protect you. And finally, and I think most intriguingly, is this little pendant, which would have been worn round the neck. This one was thought to be owned by a soldier from the First World War with the fingers like that, which was the traditional symbol for horns, which would protect you from the evil eye. So he'd have that round his neck. There are lots and lots more beside these. Catherine Hamilton has some even more unlikely objects that caught Lovett's imagination. A piece of mandrake root, um, wow. which mandrake was really known for sort of being um, growing in a human form and was thought to um, shriek when, it, when you pulled it out of the ground. Well, this really looks like a man, doesn't it? It does. Um, Lovett found that they were still to be bought in London in the, the early 20th century. Lovett's conversations revealed that Mandrake was thought to give women power over the actions of men, 
and would also help fertility. And how old is this? This is from about 1920. It's amazing, isn't it? Even then, people are thinking along these lines. Now, what is that? This is a glass rolling pin, which was apparently given to sailors by their sweethearts and wives as token a good luck. Of, yes, yeah. token of love, it says there. Yeah, so they were sort of good luck charms to be sent with them when they went off to sea. Um, they apparently were filled with rum on their way out. Right. And then when their sailors brought them back, they um, were filled with perfume for their sweetheart. These were quite common in the 19th century for sailors to take, and they were brought back and then hung up in the home. I think it was thought that um, they could only be used once to be lucky. Um, and was the idea to keep the guy, the husband or the sweetheart, true and loyal? Is that a...? Probably. That's the thinking, Probably, is it? yeah. Now, what are those? Now, this has a really interesting story. These are pieces of bread, and they're apparently known to be a cure for whooping cough. In the early 20th century, a lot of children would get whooping cough. Um, the story went that if your child had whooping cough, you would um, chop off a piece of its hair, put it in a bread and butter sandwich, and the next morning, open your door, throw the butter, bread and butter onto the street, a dog would come along and eat it, um, and then your child would be cured of whooping cough. So the whooping cough would be transferred from the child to the dog? To the dog. Via this piece of bread. Did, did Lovett himself believe in any of these superstitions? Yeah, this one he um, is known to have recommended to um, somebody, uh, a woman in Bethnal Green in 1913. He met, who had a child with whooping cough. He recommended this to her. Um, and he met her a few days later and apparently it had worked. It had Within wo six hours. It had worked? Yeah. Oh, that's this extraordinary. Is quite... This Weird. is a cat skin. Love it. Kind of found a story about this that Belgian refugees brought in with them and they would wear them under their clothing to prevent rheumatism. So it was thought to be a cure for rheumatism basically to wear a cat skin. A genuine cat skin. A genuine so cat do you, skin. Do you kill your cat first or do you find a dead cat? I'm not sure whether it has to be your own cat. Love it was quite an eccentric character all in all, wasn't he? Yeah, he was known for his eccentricities, I think. Um, he collected all sorts of different things, not just superstitions, he was really well known for a doll collection as well. Um, and also just he was, seemed to be becoming obsessed with every little thing, so he'd get an idea in his head he wanted to collect mangles. And it's mangles known, from a, a washing, yeah, washing machine? Yeah, and it's known he had 100 mangles in his house. It must have been mangles. really stacked with different objects. This must be one of the oddest collections around. Yeah, I've not come across so quite so many um, superstition and charm objects in one, in one place. What do you think of the collection? It's, collection? it's my favourite collection in, in the Kiwi Museum. Is it? I find it most fascinating, yeah. Lovett wrote about his conversations and research in his book, Magic in Modern London. And although some of us might scoff at some of his more bizarre discoveries, my guess is that if Lovett were talking to today's Londoners on the streets, he'd still be hearing about a lot of strongly held beliefs in strange superstitions. This is a photograph of Hubert Cecil Booth. Hubert came to London in 1889 to study engineering and begin his impressive career. Hubert designed engines for Royal Navy battleships and built Ferris wheels in Blackpool, Vienna and Paris. He died in 1955, but he won't be remembered for battleship engines or Ferris wheels. He has a far greater claim to fame. In 1900, Hubert went to St Pancras Station and saw a demonstration of a new cleaning machine for railway carriages. The machine had high-pressure jets that blew air into carpets to get the dust to fly from one side of the carriage into a dust box on the other side. Hubert asked the inventor if he tried sucking the dust rather than blowing it away, but he was told that that was impossible. So, when he got home, he tried a little experiment. He got some cloth and he put it on an upholstered chair. Then he sucked air through it. When he looked at the other side of the cloth, he saw that he'd actually sucked up a lot of dust. Hubert then realised that what he'd just done was invent the vacuum cleaner. In 1901, Booth patented his vacuum cleaner and founded the Vacuum Cleaner Company Limited to manufacture and market it. The head office was in Parsons Green Lane in Fulham, southwest London. But there was a problem. Not only did Hubert's machine cost the then staggering sum of £350, it was so large it had to be towed by a horse. 
And there it is, now an exhibit in the Science Museum. This was cutting edge technology of the time. Originally oil powered, the motor ran a suction pump attached to huge tubes running into the property from the road. And Booth obviously knew what he was doing. London was ready for a big clean up. It was filthy. Victorian London was a pretty dirty place. People were quite obsessed by um, the amount of dirt they found in their houses and cleanliness at the time. So they, they sort of coal powered their houses, you've got open fires. Pretty, pretty dirty places, so when they started lighting them better and seeing that the houses were so dirty, they were pretty keen to clean them up as much as they could do. So, um, for example, they cleaned, using this machine, they cleaned one of the um, shops in the West End and they took out about half a tonne of dust, so it's quite a lot. By 1903, Booth was on the verge of the big time. He was invited to demonstrate to the King and Queen at Buckingham Palace. Their seal of approval, if they gave it, would be all he'd need to clean up in the capital. Hubert Cecil Booth had invented the vacuum cleaner. Despite the fact that it was so big a horse had to pull it, it was highly popular. His big chance for success in society came when he was invited to demonstrate it to the King and Queen at Buckingham Palace. This demonstration was such a success that vacuum cleaners were installed there and at Windsor Castle. Hubert's vacuum cleaner company was awarded the Royal Warrant. It then became quite fashionable in certain wealthy areas of London to have the vacuum cleaner parked outside your rather grand house to impress the neighbours. Tea parties were even held where the vacuum was demonstrated to polite society. You'd have people who'd actually get the machine around and hold a tea party around it so you'd have um, liveried men wearing white drill sort of suits with the machine and you'd be holding a tea party in the middle while they vacuum around you. It was um, de rigueur, it was the thing to be done. Such was its success that domestic staff were worried that the vacuum cleaner would actually put them out of work. That didn't stop the machine being used everywhere. The Houses of Parliament, the Savoy Hotel, the Empire Leicester Square and the Gaiety Theatre, amongst many other important buildings in the capital. But it almost came unstuck at the Royal Mint. Booth was asked to go and clean um, obviously a lot of dust in the Royal Mint. He went along, did such a successful job, was riding home and um, got stopped by the police on the way back. Apparently he'd collected quite a bit of gold dust, which um, they wanted back, so he was escorted back to the Mint to give them back the dust. How they separated out the gold, I've no idea. Tons and tons of dust that could be taken from places. Could be taken What was the largest away? amount, do you know? Oh, there are lots of stories, but I guess the best events probably got to be during the First World War. Um, he had to go up to Crystal Palace. They'd had an outbreak of fever called spotted fever, um, which is a, a type of typhus, so it could be quite dangerous. They tried all sorts of methods to try and get rid of the disease, so he called in Booth to clean Crystal Palace. It took four weeks and 15 machines to collect about 23 tonnes of dust. Quite a lot, apparently caked inches high on the girders. 22 tons. 23 oh, tons, that all just been building, building up. Hubert's claim to fame in the history of house cleaning was assured, and he'd made his fortune. But the hunt was on to move away from the horse drawn version and produce a portable that could sell to everyone. In 1908, a newcomer to the business, an American, was the first to mass produce the vacuum cleaner. And the rest, as they say, is history. And his name? was Hoover. This is E-Wing of Wandsworth Prison. It's hardly changed since the 1870s. But a huge refit is about to bring it into line with the 21st century. And that work will mean that a notorious part of the history of this famous prison will have gone forever, the site of the gallows. Because if you were convicted of a capital offence in London, south of the Thames, between 1878 and 1961, this is where you'd be sent to be hanged. And it was Wandsworth that saw the last gallows in England and Wales. 
Executions of criminals used to be a public spectacle. But in the 1860s, the capital punishment within prisons law was passed and the deed was confined to places like this. The last public execution was on the 26th of May, 1867, at Newgate. The first execution here was on the 8th of October, 1878. A black flag was hoisted above the prison gates and the prison bell tolled. Crowds gathered outside. What exactly happened to the condemned men and women inside these walls was always shrouded in some secrecy. Strict procedures, the so-called execution protocols, were introduced to formalise the final moments of the traitors, murderers and spies who were sent here. This used to be the condemned person's cell where they spent their last days. Mick Lydon is the longest serving member of staff at Wandsworth. He started as a guard in the 1960s and has spent his entire working life in the prison service. Now, where we are now uh -huh. is, is where the condemned guy would live in the days preceding his execution. Indeed, yeah. There was a series of rooms, there was bathrooms, there was kitchens. At the far end, there was a visiting room because they had their visits separate to anybody else. And would they be observed the whole time? Oh, yes, 24 hours a day. Um, the system, as I understand it, ran that staff would be brought in from other prisons so they didn't actually know the prisoner involved. I only have actually met two staff in my entire career, going back about 36 years. One I knew in Liverpool who told me he used to come to Wandsworth um, whenever there was an execution. He was open to admitting that, but would never ever describe the situation. And one guard known for 20 odd years only actually told me after his retirement that he was one of the staff involved that used to do the job. Well, look after the condemned man. To stay with the condemned man. What the condemned man would not know was that his cell was connected to his place of execution. Just the other side of this wall was the gallows. The doorway is now bricked up. You can just see its outline in the plaster. It's all a bit of a grisly business, isn't it? A very grisly business. Um, I'm not sure that I could do it. I'm not sure I could be involved in it. One of the few times condemned prisoners did get out of the condemned cell was to attend a church service here in the prison chapel. But because they weren't allowed any contact with any other prisoner, they were hidden away behind what would have been grills just over there. So this is the, the dreaded room itself, Stuart? Yes, it? this is the execution cell where you had the, well, the cross beam which is in the cell above and the trap doors pretty much where we're standing here now. Prison officer Stuart McLaughlin has written about the history of the prison and its role in capital punishment. The gallows were removed in 1992, but the execution room is still a chilling place. One of the original hangman's ropes still remains, although it's thought this one was never used in an execution. And Stuart also has some remarkable and dramatic evidence of what went on here. Just before the gallows were finally removed from Wandsworth, Stuart, with full permission of the prison authorities, filmed for posterity one of the regular operational checks on the equipment. That's the gallows itself, and it's rigged for a single execution. There's uh, a test bag. It's probably the only film of a working prison gallows ever taken in this country, since cameras, of course, were never normally allowed in the execution room. And the trap door's going down. Who were some of the famous, or, or should I say infamous, people who died on this spot? Well, I think probably the, the, the first infamous one would have been a uh, prisoner by the name of George Chapman. He was executed in 1903, and he was a very strong candidate for having been Jack the Ripper. In fact, uh, George Aberline, who was the lead uh, detective on the ground for the Ripper case, actually t uh, said to a colleague, oh, you've caught Jack the Ripper at last. Really? He still remains uh, a candidate for having been Jack the Ripper, having been in Whitechapel at the time, uh, although he, when he was executed in 1903, he'd actually been poisoning his, uh, his wives uh, and he was subsequently found caught and ended up on the ones with gallows. 
What about later? Later, we, uh, we had the Nazi propaganda broadcaster William Joyce, uh, known to his listeners as Lord Haw Haw. He died here on 3rd of January 1946. But possibly the most infamous case was that of Derek Bentley. It was cases such as Bentley's that helped finally bring about the abolition of capital punishment and the final removal of the gallows here. Although he was unarmed, he was sentenced to death because his accomplice shot and killed a policeman. In 1998, the Court of Appeal quashed his original conviction and granted a full posthumous pardon, 45 years after he was hanged in this room. It does actually show that yeah, the ones with gallows certainly did take the life of one innocent man. Now, capital punishment was abolished in the 1960s, but the gallows here remained until the 90s. Yes. Why was that? It was decided in the 60s, even though the law that abolished capital punishment was, in theory, only suspended it for five years. But in that five-year period, uh, all gallows were dismantled and removed, apart from the one at Wandsworth. Uh, it was deemed that to, it would be good to retain at least one working gallows for the remaining capital crimes. Also, Wandsworth was the, uh, the prison that stored all execution equipment. Uh, so if uh, another prison in the country was going to have an execution, one would have to send the kit out by train. Now this whole area is being renovated, isn't it? What, what will happen to this bit of the, of the story? Well, that's right. Uh, e wing uh, on this main part of the prison remains the only wing that has not undergone full refurbishment. So the plan is that the wing will be sealed off and everything that you see here now will be removed and it will be uh, a thoroughly modern cell area, or this may be given over to classroom. So no remains whatsoever of the gallows? You'll not be able to see any after, re after the refurbishment. So this is so the, the, the last time, really? This will be the last time. time where all those condemned girls did. Yeah, although you'd have any appreciation of what took place here. No one's been hanged in England since 1964, and the death penalty was officially abolished in 1998. And soon the scene of Wandsworth Prison's part in the story of capital punishment will also be history. Mm -hmm.